Right, well, welcome everybody. It's uh, nice to be here despite a somewhat damp day. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Chris Budd and I'm the Gresham Professor of Geometry. And today I'm going to ask the question, is a mathematician a robot? Is a mathematician a robot? Um, for those of you who've been following this series, which is called Maths and the Making of the Modern and the Future World, what I'm doing at the moment is looking at the role of maths in the government's eight great technologies. And robotics was, um, I think, the second on the list of the great technologies that the government wants to um, develop and invest in. So it's very timely that I talk a little bit about the role that maths plays in this. And what we're mostly going to look at in this talk is the way that machines learn and how, um, by learning to do tasks, they can directly affect our lives. And we're going to have a look at some of the ethical issues that that brings up. OK, so when I was uh, at school, I suppose, or a teenager, I read a lot of science fiction. I read a lot of science fiction, and one of my favourite authors, I think I read him more than just about anyone else, was this guy, and that's Isaac Asimov. Um, Isaac Asimov was incredibly forward-looking. If you read through his books, he pretty well um, gets that we're going to have something like the internet in the future. He, he writes very cogently about something called multivac, which is very like the internet. Um, but what Isaac Asimov is perhaps most famous for is he developed three laws of robotics and wrote a whole series of books about robots. His three laws of robotics were that uh, no robot should harm or um, indirectly cause harm to a human being. Every robot should obey the rules of a human being and a robot should defend its own existence. And he wrote a whole series of books um, on this, starting with the very famous iRobot book. And in these books, he imagined a future, a future, by the way, about now, so he wasn't looking that far ahead, in which robots are just like human beings. They become ordinary members of society, governed by these three laws. And the books are well worth a read, um, a popular film's been made on the same subject. Um, quite recently, here's uh, an actual robot that's been built uh, by Honda in Japan, and by some careful choice of acronyms, they managed to call this ASIMO, uh, very much in homage to the great Asimov. And ASIMO, ASIMO can be trained to do certain tasks. We'll have a look at these in um, a minute. So. One of the questions I'm going to ask today is, are robots going to become an integral part of our society? Um, why has this got an awful lot to do with mathematics? An awful lot to do with mathematics. So, um, where does the name robot come from? Uh, it was coined round about the 1920s, and it's actually a Czech word. It comes from the word robota. I hope my Czech is correct there. A robota means forced labour. And there was an incredibly forward-looking play which inspired a great deal uh, of thought uh, by uh, Capec uh, called R.U.R. Rossum's Universal Robots. And here is a picture of the cast. OK, so that's where the word robot comes from. Um, and in a sense, robots are all around us, very much all around us. Um, in a sense, what I have in my pocket, uh, my personal assistant. I don't have a secretary at work anymore. I have to use this instead. Um, it tells me when I'm supposed to be at meetings and other things. Um, so we all have very sophisticated technology in our pockets. Um, and uh, robots, as I say, are very much around us. Um, your car, if you have a car, was almost certainly built by a machine which is called a robot. Um, and here are car building robots. They don't look like the robots in Isaac Asimov's book, but they are trained 
by a computer program to do a particular task. And the task in this case is, of course, welding or um, otherwise putting a car together. And robots in this sort of role have been around for quite a while. Um, but we're just starting to see another use of robots when it comes to cars, um, and that is driving cars. So this is kind of quite a, a big thing um, that uh, robots um, are now um, being able to drive cars without human beings being involved. So uh, I think Google has a, a self-driving car which they're testing out in California. Um, it was recently involved in an accident which wasn't its fault. I think it behaved the highway code, but a truck didn't, or words to that effect. Um, so, um, and we are actually pretty close to having um, self-driving autonomous cars quite commonly uh, being used, um, particularly on motorways and so on. I, I like to say that we have self-driving cars already, we call them trains, um, but not everyone agrees with me. Um, but there's a very big difference between a car which drives itself and Asimov's vision of a universal robot. Um, so one of the questions I'm going to try to address in this talk is how close are we to this vision that Asimov had of a universal robot? So, in order to try to answer that question, and, I, and, and, and I'll tell you a bit about some of the maths behind it, um, we need to kind of define a little bit about what we mean by a robot. Um, we often think of a robot as a sort of mechanical man or woman with arms and legs and stuff like that, but really the thing which is important in a robot is its brain, okay? Its intelligence. It's that which makes it capable of doing tasks uh, in a kind of free uh, way. Um, and this brings us into the kind of area of artificial intelligence. And there are basically two types of artificial intelligence. Um, the artificial intelligence that Asimov was thinking of for his robots is what we would call strong artificial intelligence. It's the ability of a robot to think and behave in the same sort of way as a human being to make free associations, to exhibit a degree of, quotes, free will, to be creative and to exhibit this general intelligence that human beings have. So that is a very, very strong concept. Um, and it was studied in great detail by the very great Alan Turing here. Um, Alan Turing, uh, was, you know, true pioneer of computers, of machine learning. Um, during the war, of course, he was famous for uh, breaking the, the German codes, the Enigma codes. And after the war, he played a dominant role in the early development of the electronic computer. Um, and one thing he's extremely famous for is the Turing test, which he proposed in the early 50s or late 1940s, um, in which... He said a test for true artificial intelligence is if you could have a conversation with a, a robot um, and be unable to judge, presumably without seeing the robot, whether um, that was a human being or not. That is the Turing test. Um, and no robot at the moment has come anywhere close to this. Um, that, of course, doesn't stop films being made. Um, this is a, a fairly recent film called Ex Machina, um, and the, the basic story is that a computer programmer is brought in by the creator of this uh, rather attractive robot um, to decide whether she, in this case, um, is artificial in uh, has artificial intelligence in the sense of the Turing test, and after a week's um, intensive conversation with her, um, she proves that she does have intelligence by murdering him and he, her creator. Okay, so uh, <laughs> there we go. Um, it's, it's a good film, uh, if somewhat scary. Okay, um, so that is strong artificial intelligence. We're not really close to that. Though we'll have a talk, think about that in this, in this lecture. 
Um, what we do have, though, is weak artificial intelligence. And this is what I really want to talk about today. And what weak artific artificial intelligence is, is the ability for a robot to be trained to do a specific task. Um, and by trained, it can be trained by kind of self-learning. And this is really the important thing, that it can learn how to do a task. I don't mean a task in general, like uh, artificial intelligence in the strong sense, but a particular one, but it can be particularly complex. And this is what we call machine learning. And um, machine learning is very much going to be the subject of today's talk. Um, and as I say, when I was thinking about what they meant in uh, the eight great technologies about robotics, I decided they had to mean this because strong artificial intelligence at the moment is so far away um, that investment in it is unclear, but this is something which is really developing insanely fast and um, is going to really change a, a great deal of things. So here are some examples of machine learning. We'll look at a lot more. Um, so speech recognition. Uh, so my first ever paper, I was, which I wrote something like 35 years ago, was on speech recognition. Um, I was working at the time for Marconi, um, and in those days, um, speech recognition was extremely crude. Um, they were developing speech recognition at that time for cockpits, so a pilot could say something and the aeroplane would respond um, to what the pilot was saying. Um, nowadays, speech recognition is actually very sophisticated. This is the Siri uh, 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 a mobile phone, which uh, will basically, you can talk to it and it more or less ish understands what you're saying. So, speech recognition is something that's come on hugely in the last 30 years and is um, an example where a machine has learnt to do a particular task. Uh, fraud detection is another thing. Uh, if you make some sort of transaction, um, that is often checked by a machine learning algorithm to see whether it's correct or not. So just before Christmas, uh, I bought my uh, children a film to watch over Christmas and immediately my phone buzzed, did you really want to buy this film? They said. So um, that was done by a machine learning algorithm. Um, and extremely sophisticated versions of this are used uh, by banks and even by MI5 and so on. Um, car driving is another example of, of, of this process where you teach a computer to do a specific task. Um, so um, the Royal Society uh, recently brought out a, a really rather good report. I, I thoroughly recommend that you look at this. Um, if you pick up the uh, transcript for this lecture, you'll see uh, a reference to the Royal Society report. And here it is, they define machine learning to be that branch of artificial intelligence which allows computer systems to learn from example, to learn from watching, learning, and doing. Um, here's this famous Asimo computer. Uh, I should have animated this, really, but this is a, 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 a clip from a, a, a movie where these people here are sort of dancing, and Asimo watches them and then dances along with it. OK, so you can learn how to dance. Bye if you're a robot like that. Um, and here's a statement from Google, who of course Google is world leading in machine learning in many different ways. Um, machine learning is a core transformative way by which we are rethinking everything we are doing. Uh, one thing that Google does, you, I've always wondered a little bit how Google makes its money. Uh, and the way Google makes its money is that when you do internet searches on Google, um, the internet search is done by uh, a rather nice mathematical algorithm involving eigenvalues and matrices. Um, it, by watching you how you do your, your, your internet searches, builds up a sort of character profile for who you are. And based on that character profile, a machine learning algorithm then places adverts uh, on, you know, as you kind of browse through um, to encourage you to buy certain things. And those adverts are based 
by a machine learning algorithm on what they think you will like. Um, Amazon um, does something similar when, when it sells you things. So um, this is how these guys are making their money and therefore they're investing a lot um, into it. So what I want to do today is tell you quite a bit about machine learning and how, how it works and some of the maths behind it. Um, but I thought I'd do that by taking you on a sort of historical tour to show you uh, where machine learning kind of comes from and some of the um, uh, ideas that uh, went into its evolution. Um, and, well, what was the first example of artificial intelligence? Where did people start thinking in terms of training machines to do things? Well, it wasn't to help society, it wasn't to build robots, it was to do something much loftier and more important, which was playing chess. Okay, so um, perhaps one of the earliest examples of artificial intelligence, in the sense of weak artificial intelligence, was uh, writing chess playing um, computer, computer programs. Um, and two of my great heroes, Turing, we had his picture up uh, just a minute ago, and Shannon, those of you who came to my last lecture on maths is maths coded in your genes will have met Shannon, um, the, one of the great pioneers of the theory of information. Um, so both of these guys, uh, after the war, when people can start thinking about other things, um, started thinking about uh, artificial intelligence in the context of designing programs to play chess. Um, and here's a quote from Shannon's paper. Again, if you go onto my uh, transcript, you'll see that paper highlighted. He said, and this is actually a very useful quote. Um, it, it, it lies behind an enormous amount of the way that we do research into many things. Um, although of no practical importance, that's chess playing, the question is of theoretical interest, and it's hoped that it will act as a wedge in tackling other problems of greater significance. These are very prescient words. Uh, Shannon was absolutely bang on here that the ideas that they developed to play chess are still very much what we use in artificial intelligence. So um, chess playing computers have uh, basically um, changed remarkably in the last few years, but when they started, um, the way people thought that they should work was that you should kind of imitate the way a grandmaster played chess, think about how a grandmaster looks at a chess position, weighs it up, compares one uh, position against another, and try to build all that kind of wisdom into a computer program. So that was kind of how chess playing computers started. Um, and of course they have the advantage over uh, a human, that whilst a human might be able to evaluate, I don't know, 10 positions a second if you're doing well, incredibly well, a computer can do millions of positions a second. So by sheer brute force, and at that time quite a bit of ignorance, uh, they could design computer programs that could beat chess players. Um, and again, going back to Shannon, uh, he, he suggested that there might be two types of ways to do this. Uh, one is that you examine all possible moves, and that's very uh, expensive because if you have a chess game, then there might be, I don't know, 20 moves, legal moves possible from one position, 20 from the next, 20 from the next. So after three moves, you've already got 8,000 possible things to evaluate, and it rapidly gets very, very big. Um, the second was to build a kind of tree um, of possible moves and prune that tree um, so that bad moves just get uh, rejected and you just go down the good route. And tree learning algorithms are hugely important still um, in rather more important areas than playing chess, such as natural language recognition. The sort of speech recognition that Siri has will be based on type B learning, which started with Shannon and Turing and chess playing. So this strategy for designing chess programs uh, evolved and a lot of investment went into it and uh, this process uh, gradually got computers which could be a human, uh, a normal human player and then a good player and then a 
international player. And then in 1997, uh, the great uh, day came when Gary Kasparov, who at the time was the uh, world chess champion and no one could beat him, poor old Nigel Short. I remember watching Nigel Short play against Gary Kasparov and they had to stop it after a while to uh, save further pain. Um, um, but anyway, in 1997, he was built, beaten by uh, a, a computer about the size of a, you know, well, not much bigger than a normal laptop. Um, and uh, Deep Blue beat him, and that was kind of a, a huge um, kind of landmark in, in computer chess. Um, and this strategy uh, has continued since, and um, now we have a computer program called Stockfish, um, which uh, has followed this route of taking the wisdom of the Grand Masters, building up these trees, and so on and so on, to try to um, uh, get the most sophisticated computer, and that's uh, state-of-the-art going through this. However, all of this changed completely last year. Last year, so it's a very up-to-date talk. Um, <laughs> it is. So, in fact, it was the end of last year, and so good thing I'm doing this talk now, um, with something came along called Alpha Zero. And Alpha Zero was a product of Google, it was a product of the DeepMind team um, at Google, and it took a totally different approach to uh, this approach of building wisdom into the computer. And what they did, they, they, this was a thing called a tabula rasa approach, where all they did was they gave the computer the rule book, nothing more. They gave him the, the computer the rule book and said, right, play, play. And it played of the order of 700,000 games of chess against itself, purely against itself, worked out when it was winning and so on, um, adjusted the program so it would continue to win, and by playing against itself, learning by doing, this is the machine learning concept, it got to a point after this 700,000 games where it could play at the same level as a grandmaster. Okay, so we're going to talk about how it did that presently. Um, so having done that, they then tried it against this stockfish uh, program and it beat it hollow. It, uh, it essentially, be every one on every game, um, and here is a, uh, a table. The ELO is the kind of uh, strength of a computer uh, or human player of chess, um, and this is a graph saying a stockfish in green, alpha zero in blue, and providing alpha zero is allowed more than about a second per move, particularly if it's allowed ten seconds per move, it, it will have a convincingly higher uh, score than stockfish, and that. They're both convincingly higher than a grandmaster. So there we are. Uh, all you have to do is give it the rule book, get it to play against itself, and it will be all the wisdom of all the ages in the other machine. And that is an enormous breakthrough, and it is very scary. And somewhat, well, what is it? It's amazing. Um, one of the unfortunate things, one of my best friends is a guy called Ken Reagan. Uh, who works at the University of Buffalo in New York. And Ken is a mathematician, he's a very good mathematician, he's a logician, but he's also the world expert in chess cheating. Um, one of the problems with having sophisticated computers that can play chess is that if you can secrete one of these about your par uh, person and somehow refer to it without anyone noticing, you can beat anyone. And so uh, these uh, chess cheating, a whole new world has become possible. And his job is to, by looking at matches, working out whether people are cheating or not, in the sense that they're playing too well uh, for their own uh, general ability. OK, so computers can play chess. Can they do anything else? Well, the same team that did Alpha Zero uh, tried Go. And they uh, wrote a, a program called Alpha Go. Actually, this was a bit earlier than Alpha Zero. Um, and in 2016, still pretty recently, um, it it uh, took on Lee Sedol, which is the great Ga Go master, and beat and beat him as well. And Go was reckoned to be a harder game than chess, um, and yet it still beat beat them. And 
What else can they be used for? Well, they can be used for poker and even Scrabble. OK, so uh, there we are. So that's where we've got to um, with, uh, with sophistication. Let's say this is extremely up to date. The concept of a machine where if you just give it the rule book and it plays against itself, so the robot plays against itself, um, it can beat uh, a human component, opponent convincingly. Now, you might think, well, OK, that's, it's all a game. Do we need to worry? And in a sense, we don't. If a computer gets great at chess, that's fine. Chess is, a, in a sense, a very mechanical game. There are a limited number of possibilities at each move. Um, you'd expect a computer to do well at it. But these sort of algorithms are now being used in ra rather more worrying and ethically challenging areas. Um, and in particular, um, they can be used in something like recruitment. Uh, <clears throat> so we recently had a job uh, at Bath for a lecturer. We had 300 applications. 300 applications for one job. Each applicant sent in a, a CV. That CV might have been 30 sides long. Okay. Somehow we had to read all those CVs and make a, a good, informed and fair judgment on that candidate. Okay. And that's a very, very big job. Um, it's not um, surprising that firms who have a lot of applicants for a job might want to find some way of, of, of shortcutting that procedure. And um, it is certainly true that one method to do this is to feed a computer a large number of CVs, uh, to tell the computer who you hired and who you didn't, and it will then look through those CVs to work out features of those CVs uh, which uh, relate to someone being hired or not, and uh, then um, they can use those to essentially shortlist candidates. So that is a procedure that is, it is being used. Um, it's not just being used for that. Uh, in America, uh, slightly related processes are being used to make decisions on uh, jail sentences and so on. Um, and... There are all sorts of problems with that. One problem is they've found is that if you train a computer by showing it CVs where you've made a judgment, all your implicit bias or even explicit bias ends up in the computer as well. So though it's a machine, it's still a biased machine and makes judgments on people's race and so on like that. So um, this is where things are heading. Um, and so I'm now going to sort of talk about how we've got to that point how machines are making those judgments and um, what some of the issue, ethical issues are of that. So now we're going to talk a bit more mathematically, as it were. Um, so a little bit of history, again, of the computer. Um, um, so we, Shannon and uh, Turing uh, in the late 1940s were looking at machine intelligence and so on. And one of the other great heroes, uh, in the whole thing was von Neumann in America. Um, and again, in the 1940s, that's what a computer looked like. That has about the same amount of power as you know, a, a tenth of a mobile phone. Um, but um, the general programmable computer um, started um, getting going, I say, in the 1940s, 1950s, um, and in the 1960s with the development of the microchip um, so smaller and more powerful computers became uh, readily available. And it was kind of then that people started thinking very much about how machines um, learn and how they can be taught. Um, so um, this is the sort of question, how do machines learn? Um, and rather than talking in general, uh, I, I'd like to talk in, in particular about something which machines can certainly be useful for, which is to recognise handwriting. Okay? So if you uh, want a machine to do something may, may be useful, you might have something which can read someone's handwriting or read numbers, and then that could be used, for example, to sort your post or something like that. Um, so how do machines learn? Let's suppose that we have uh, a number of digits like this, so we've got threes and fours, 
um, and we want the computer to be able to separate them out. Um, the way uh, a machine learning algorithm works is that you have two halves. Uh, one is where you feed it um, a large number of examples of the, the two digits, the threes and fours, um, and in this case you might tell the computer in advance which is a three, which is a four. Um, it then trains itself to construct an algorithm whereby if you feed it in the sort of parameters that might make up a three, so we can essentially feed in about two or three parameters uh, which describes that picture, it will learn which parameters are relevant to threes and which are relevant to fours. That then becomes a digit recognizer and then if you feed it anything in the future, it will spit out a three or a four. So this is the basic process. You have a learning algorithm followed by something which then implements that. Oh, there's something in the middle which I've left out, which is a, a verification. So after learning, you might want to check it on a whole load more things. And then once you've done that, you have your recognizer. Um, so one of the big breakthroughs in all of this came in the um, 1960s uh, with the sophisticated computers that were coming online and an idea called the neural network. This is 1963. Um, and the neural network was a very unsophisticated attempt to kind of reproduce some of the ways that it was perceived that uh, neurons worked in the brain. Um, and so the next few slides are going to be a bit more math mathematical than we've had up to now. Um, but the basic idea of a neural network is that you have a number of inputs to it. Now, with our digital recognizer, those inputs, you could take a photo of the three and take a photo of the four, and there might be things like the height, the width, um, the number of uh, connections there are in, in the thing. Uh, if you're more sophisticated, um, you can do what's called a singular value decomposition, look at what are called the principal components. So these are inputs from the picture that uh, uh, go in. Um, and then you combine these with things called weights. I'll show you the formula in a second, but basically you weigh, you, you, you uh, 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 attribute different amounts of importance to different bits of the image. So some bits of the image will be more important than others. Um, and then in the neural net, you combine these by adding them up. Um, and then you feed these into a step uh, function, which basically says, oh, if this sum is above a certain threshold, we'll say it's a three. And if it's below a certain threshold, we'll say it's a four. And that's the output. Um, and that's a neural net, uh, and in its simplest form, it's called a perceptron, something which can perceive. And uh, that uh, relatively simple little thing is the basis of a large amount of modern machine learning. Now, we don't know what these are. These are what we have to find, these values here, in the training part of the process. So that's, that's our, what we call the unknowns. So here's a kind of mathematical representation of this. The output is the sum of the weighted inputs. And if that sum is bigger than uh, a threshold, I'll call C, then the output is 1. And if it's less than C, it's 0. And if it's equal to C, we give it an output of a half. So that's it. And if it's 1, we'll say it's a 3. And if it's 0, we'll say it's a 4. And what the machine learning process has to do is if you give it the digits 3 and digits 4 to try to find these numbers and probably how many inputs you need so that um, this will consistently uh, recognize the difference between a 3 and a 4. Now it turns out with the 3 and 4 that you only need to basically look at two characteristics. Um, uh, more or less one is the, the, the height and the other is what we call the second moment of, it, um, of, of the thing. Um, and so, um, oh, so that's basically what I've said. We train this on this data 
and I find the weights. Um, so we, we have two inputs. One is the, the, the height and the other is this famous second moment. And we're going to try to find these two weights, W1 and W2, and the threshold C, so that we can differentiate between threes and fours. Um, and if you take a whole load of threes and fours, here's a, a picture where M with three represents uh, inputs X1 and X2 corresponding to the digit three. So all of these will be the various digits. Um, the blues represent all the inputs corresponding to the digit four. Um, the red line is a choice of values w, w1 and w2, which doesn't differentiate between the two. But the purple line it corresponds to a choice of values w1 and w2, so that every point to the left, which would be lower than c, and so it would give a value zero in the perceptron, tells you the four, and everything to the right tells you a three. So it's a, a very robust method. Um, it doesn't kind of work every time. There might be a few which are, are slightly to one side. Um, but by and large, it's a robust way of separating the data into threes and fours. And um, that is how the perceptron works in this case. Um, it's relatively easy to find two parameters. It's much harder to find many more. But that's what mathematicians do. That's what we're trained to do. OK, so that's, that's uh, digits. Uh, you can do the same with uh, dogs and cats. So um, here is, uh, um, this is taken, by the way, from the Wikipedia entry on neural nets, um, where they suggest that uh, you can have a sort of scale for how domestic something is, a scale for how large something is. Uh, so a wolf is large and not very domesticated. Chihuahua there is small and very domesticated. Um, dogs and wolves are basically larger than cats. Um, and so you can kind of draw this line through it the same way we did digits threes and fours. And that will tell you which is a dog and which is a cat. So presumably my dog's got something in its brain to work out which to bark at. Okay. So that's um, the perceptron. Now the perceptron, as I say, was developed in the 1960s and sort of didn't do anything for a while. Um, the reason it didn't do anything for a while was it took some time for um, computers to get sophisticated enough to move away from this relatively simple way of separating two things. That's what we call linearly separable. Um, but um, in recent years, uh, we've evolved a thing called deep learning and deep neural nets. And what a deep learning process is, is a whole load of these perceptrons, one after the other. So we have our inputs. Uh, the inputs are combined uh, in these different ways uh, into these different outputs. The output from that is then combined. The output from that is then combined. And eventually, it makes some sort of decision one way or the other. Um, and each of these uh, stages, if I go back to this formula, uh, is applying that same formula at each stage. And each formula has all these weights associated with it. Um, so that's kind of the, the uh, concept. Relatively simple mathematically, uh, each of these is what we call a convolution of the output with the weights. And nowadays, uh, these are often called convolutional neural networks. So here's a convolutional neural network with, with these various stages of convolution. Pooling is where it's all combined. And this is an example where they show it a picture, and uh, the value it comes out at the other end is 0.94, and that can work out that that is a boat. Um, and if you ever use Facebook, um, on Facebook there is technology which will actually recognize your face. And uh, face recognition is done uh, on exactly this process. Um, so um, the way all of these work is basically the same. You have these weights, the WIs, um, and you need to allocate those weights 
so that if you put in an input and you know what the output is, you'll get a consistent link between the input and the output, um, and it can then differentiate between different things and learn as it does this. Um, and there are two types of learning. Um, there's what we call supervised learning, and supervised learning is what I've just described to you for the uh, digit recognition, where you give the uh, neural net a whole load of things where you've told it what the answer is, and it goes off and adjusts its weights to uh, be able to differentiate between those different answers. Um, and the other form is called reinforcement learning, which possibly, well, re super supervised learning is what might happen in a school or a university where you're telling a student something. A reinforcement is more how uh, young children would learn, which is you do things, you make mistakes, you learn from your mistakes, and you adjust your behavior to stop making those mistakes. Um, and reinforcement learning was how alpha zero worked. Um, mathematically, this is where I come in, very much where I come in. This is essentially my day job. Um, the mathematical problem is to find these weights, these numbers wi. And that's hard because uh, a deep neural net may have thousands, possibly even millions of these, and you want to find exactly the right combination which will link the input to the output. Um, and this uses nice numerical methods uh, for what we call optimization methods originally designed for other tasks, uh, like designing airplanes and stuff like that. Um, uh, these, these are various uh, techniques. Quasar Newton is, is the one I most use in my own work um, um, for uh, finding the weights. And one of, uh, whilst a big breakthrough in, in um, neural networks has been fast and heavy duty computers, I would say equal uh, responsibility, even perhaps more so, in the modern machine learning algorithms has been the development of these very fast numerical methods. Um, and I say this is exactly what I do in my work. My, my, even my PhD was in this area. Um, so that's, that's the math, as it were. That's why I'm giving this talk. Um, so alpha zero, the one that we talked about, the chess playing thing, used reinforcement learning um, to, by learning by its mistakes. Uh, it played 700,000 games against itself. It didn't take terribly long because it's very fast. It's, it has a lot of grunt to it. it it's, uh, say, Google machine. It's not far from here in North London. Um, and it did a, used what's called a Monte Carlo tree search algorithm to get all the weights. So that's how it works. Um, so in terms of uh, CVs, you could feed CVs. That's be your input into the machine. So, uh, you know, uh, how many A-levels does this person have? Uh, uh, how much money do they earn in their last job? All that sort of stuff. Um, compare that against whether they're recruited or not and find your weights and out comes the answer. Aha. Uh -huh. So let's have a look at some of the things these are now used for. So uh, uh, they're used for, for example, computer vision. Uh, again, this was an area I worked in some years ago where you look at a, an image and you segment it into different areas so you can get people. Um, a somewhat scary use of this is by the home office that wants to look at a crowd and see if they can spot terrorists in the crowd, either by recognising their features or by the types of thing they're doing, the way they are behaving. So that's something that's being used. Uh, another application is in investment planning. Uh, I, I, I'm sure it's not unreasonable to say that the average age for a Gresham audience is slightly higher than the average age of a school audience that I talk to. Um, and so uh, at the Gresham audience age, you might be thinking of investment options for retirement. Um, and uh, a number of uh, companies are now using machine learning for this. And they claim that people prefer to talk to a, a machine rather than a person because it doesn't make value judgments on them. That's one thing to think about. Um, diagnosis. Uh, this is an area I'm actively working in in my research. Um, the idea here being whether uh, you can uh, use a machine. If you tell it your symptoms, it can work out what's wrong with you. 
Okay. Uh, so that's machine diagnosis. Um, what I'm involved with and is a, is a project um, which is sponsored by the Arthroplasty for Arthritis uh, Foundation um, is to have techniques where uh, if you uh, show the computer um, an X-ray image of a uh, hip um, which has gone through some sort of trauma, um, this hasn't gone through trauma and that's deliberate, I didn't want to show you a traumatised one, um, it can, um, using a machine learning algorithm, uh, work out what sort of fracture there is and advise the doctor very quickly. Um, and the reason they want to do this is that often um, images are taken in circumstances where a consultant isn't immediately available and, and it can speed up the diagnosis procedure. Um, so I, I think that's a, a very good use of this and uh, obviously uh, it's going through a huge amount of medical uh, testing before it's going to be properly used. So these are kind of various things um, that um, computers are uh, now being used for. Um, but there are very, very significant issues that this brings up. As I said, as far as I'm concerned, what's going on is I do this. That's what I do, okay? And that doesn't look very much like a human being thinking about whether someone should get a job from a CV, okay? That's just a, uh, an optimization algorithm. Um, and so um, we have to be very careful. Machine learning algorithms are very much a black box. Once I've trained something up and I've got all my weights, I've no real idea why it's making its decisions the way it's making them. And, and so we have to be very careful when using them to make decisions about human beings. If a machine learning algorithm has decided that someone should get a 10-year sentence, how are we going to appeal against that? Okay, how are we going to appeal against it? So this raises very, very significant ethical issues things that people are thinking about. Um, and at this point, I want to make a small advert, if I'm allowed to. Um, and here's the advert. Uh, my own university, in fact, my own institute, is having a semester called Machine Learning, Algorithms and Ethics, uh, with a whole series of talks uh, related to algorithms and ethics uh, associated with machine learning. If you look carefully, you'll see it's a mathematician, a robot. There it is. Uh, we're even advertising this talk through it. Um, and there'll be a whole load of uh, things. And if you want to come over to Bath uh, in May, we're going to have a big public debate about all this. It's free. Um, please come along if you want to. And you can go onto the, the Bath website. Um, and the reason we're doing this um, is we think in Bath these issues are so important, people need to talk about them. So let's have a look at some reasons why machine learning can be quite problematic. Um, one is this, uh, in learning algorithms, because you've got lots of computer power and quite a lot of data, and you can feed loads and loads of data to the computer, it can do that, and if you feed anything enough data, it's possible to draw many false connections. Um, there was a real fashion, particularly in the 1970s, of playing LPs backwards. Okay, you could do this, you can't do it with a CD, but you could play an LP backwards, and it was claimed that lots of LPs had hidden messages in them. Okay, and the reason is, if you look at enough random things, you're going to see hidden messages. Okay, um, so that's a worry, that computers will draw false conclusions. Here's a nice graph uh, that I took uh, for one of the references, again, in, our, in, the, in the notes. Um, of, of uh, date, uh, 1999 to 2009. Um, in red, you see the US spending on science and technology, and on the black, you see suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation, and you can see there's clear correlation. Okay. So you would conclude from this that it's really important to stop spending on science. Uh, I, I believe that Donald Trump is following this. Um, okay, very strong correlation a machine might be duped into that. Um, the reason there is a correlation is that spending on science and the number of suicides both essentially are linked to annual GP. Uh, the, the higher the general, uh, you know, the product, gross national product, uh, the more spending on science you have and the more stressed people are 
and so they're more likely to commit suicide. So uh, that, that's the reason behind that. So correlation doesn't imply causation. Uh, and as I said, if you give a computer enough or anyone enough data, you can sort of draw conclusions from it, which may be false. Um, and one of the ways I love to think about it is if on a nice sunny day, which we're not in, but if you're in, in the summer, if you go and look at the clouds, eventually, by looking at enough clouds, you can see a picture of something that you might find familiar. Okay, and here's an example. <laughs> um, and it looks remarkably like my dog, actually. Um, Except he's got, my dog's got longer ears. But anyway, I hope you can all see a teddy bear there. Uh, I wish I'd taken that photo myself, but sadly that came from the internet. But that's the problem. If you have enough data, you can, you can see. And, and, and um, in the case of playing records backwards, that was actually a problem because uh, people were accused of, of, of falsely misleading young people by these messages. Um, so that's one reason we should be worried. Um, another is that despite their sophistication... Machines can get it wrong. Um, this was an example. My colleague James Davenport, Professor James Davenport, who is organising this semester at Bath, um, uh, advises the, the government on machine learning. And here's an example he showed where uh, it was to do with cars and training cars to drive. Um, one of the things you'd expect an automatic car to be able to do is recognise road signs. So they fed it a whole load of road signs and it consistently identified that as a 45 mile per hour speed sign. So there we are. Um, so there's a new defence against speeding. My computer got it wrong. OK, so com machines get it wrong. Um, here's an interesting one. Um, we think in a certain way because we're human beings and computers don't necessarily think the same way. Why should they? Their brains are not the same as ours. Um, and here's a, a really wonderful example, a very classical example, um, called the checkerboard uh, example, where you have this cylinder which is casting a shadow over here, and our brains have adjusted the picture to allow for the shadow. Um, and what's really weird is the, the square A there and the square B there, if you actually look at them close up, are exactly the same colour. They are exactly the same. A and B are exactly the same colour, but uh, um, our brain has lightened it because it thinks it's in shadow. Okay. So our brain would say those are different. A computer would say possibly they are the same. And so computers and human beings simply don't think the same way. Um, and as I said, um, other ethical issues, particularly with uh, the training approach, is the supervised training approach is that if we train a computer to make judgments, um, then it will be <coughs> inheriting all the biases that we put into our own decision making in its training. We might look at a box uh, on, you know, and think, hey, it can't be biased, but actually it can be because it's all got our biases built in. And this sort of implicit machine bias is now recognised and um, something that people worry about. So there are all these big ethical issues um, which uh, we need to worry about. As I say, do come along to Bath to find out a few. Um, so I'm going to conclude my talk with coming right back to the title of the talk, which is, is a robot a mathematician? So we've seen how mathematics, particularly optimization algorithms and neural nets, can be used to train a computer. But we can ask the flip question, can a robot itself be a mathematician? This is an extremely important question for me to ask because I want to know if I'm going to be in a job in the future. Um, there was a rather famous uh, professor in Warwick. I won't say her name, but she's a rather prominent, prominent feminist um, who said that they should, quote, shut down the maths department to Warwick. By the way, the maths department in Warwick is one of the best in the world, if not the best in the world, because, quote, now we've got computers, we don't need these mathematicians anymore, do we? OK. So there we are. So um, can a robot mathematician? In a sense, yes, they can. Um, computers, this is the Met Office computer. I spend a lot of my time at the Met Office. I'm there tomorrow. Calculate very, very fast. And because they can calculate very, very fast, they can do calculations that I couldn't possibly do. So computers can solve sophisticated weather forecasting. 
um, equations uh, which I couldn't solve by hand. And yet I'm still, I still have to program that computer. So yes, they can replace me in doing the calculations, but not necessarily replace me in programming. Here's another answer. Answer two, yes, um, they can do algebra. So again, when I was at school, computers could just about add up. Um, our calculators were just coming in. Um, and then when I was doing my PhD, uh, the first computer algebra packages came along. Uh, and I remember very much um, there was one particular integral that I'd done. It had taken me two weeks to do it. It was so hard. I was very proud of myself. I got an answer which I believed in, and I fed it into a computer algebra package, and it took about two seconds to do the same thing. So they can now do algebra. Um, and in my next series of talks, when I talk about maths in the future, I'm going to look at mathematical education and, and what changes to education I'm expecting things like computer algebra to make. Okay, so that's in the next, not this program, but the next, next year's program. Uh, answer three, uh, you can train computers to pass exams. So the, the Today robot uh, is a, f a fairly famous example. Uh, in Tokyo, they tried to train a robot to pass the entrance exam for Japanese universities, and they found it did rather well on the maths tests. <laughs> so there we are. Uh, it didn't do quite as well on, on the physics, and it was rubbish at philosophy. But anyway, <laughs> uh, you can train it to pass maths exams. Um, so there's the three yes answers, but here are two no ones. Uh, second, that um, there are many math problems out there that even fast computers can't solve well. They're what we call NP problems, uh, NP hard, um, uh, which can't be solved. Poly polynomial time means basically you can compute them in a reasonable time on a computer. Um, and a good example of a hard problem which at the moment computers can't crack is factorising large numbers. Um, if you take a number which is a product to two prime numbers, it's incredibly hard to factorise it. Fortunately for us, because the security of our banking system relies on this. Uh, so there are genuinely hard problems out there which even fast computers can't solve. Um, and one which I'm particularly interested in, um, I was challenged by a machine learning uh, expert. Um, th their basic point was, why do you bother writing sophisticated programs for forecasting the weather, surely it's an example of where machine learning will just do it. Uh, so we've tried. Um, the weather has uh, at least a billion degrees of freedom, probably more. And we find that uh, machine learning is actually pretty good if you want to forecast the weather up to about three or four hours in advance, but rapidly becomes poor, which is actually can be useful if you run a wind farm or uh, you're about to have a sporting event, that could be quite useful. Um, but less useful for the test match, where we're fine, we're less England collapses in the first day. But um, um, so at the moment, we don't think that um, computers can forecast the weather. Um, it's a somewhat more sophisticated thing, which is that uh, in the year uh, 1900, Hilbert, the great mathematician, uh, attempted to uh, f show that all mathematics could be reduced to uh, arithmetical operations. Uh, if so, then a computer could display genuine mathematical reasoning. Uh, but Gödel in the 1930s um, showed that, um, it, that it was not possible. There were mathematical things which uh, simply couldn't be reduced to arithmetical operations um, and therefore could never be done on a computer. And this is actually important. There is actually a limit to a computer's ability to do mathematical reasoning and therefore, I would argue, to general reasoning. Um, but a couple of challenges. Let's see where we're going. Machine learning is going very, very fast and improving very well, and I'm sure that it will be uh, doing an incredible amount of things in the near future. So here's a test. Maybe could we play at the works of Mozart and ask it to compose a symphony? So that I would regard as a machine learning task. We just, you know, can you compose a symphony? That's a fairly straightforward operation. Well, not straightforward, but it's straightforward to define. Can we play at the works of Mozart and see whether it can do something which is indistinguishable in imagination and invention from a human being? So I wonder whether I will see that day. Um, but even if I do see that day, I think we're still as far away from general AI as possible. And 
Can a mathematician be a robot? I think this picture sums it all up, one way or the other. Thank you very much.